Hello, hello. Welcome to Ask Me Monday number 70. 70. Who knew? Um, hello, I'm Vicki Howell, your host, and I am happy to be here with you the day after Mother's Day if you're in North America. Just like to give a shout out to all of you mothers all over the world, um, even if you celebrated another day. Good job doing all that you do. It is a multifaceted job. Congratulations on either making a human being in your body or doing the work to find your family however you had to do it. And I just thought, you know what? I wanted to give a little shout out to all the moms this week. So today's episode, all of the content is brought to you by you. So I asked, I put a little shout out yesterday um, to see if any of the moms out there had questions about small business, knitting, crochet, crafting, sewing, whatever, and you had a bunch of stuff to say, so I'm going to cover a lot. I thought since it's episode number 70, I would choose seven because 70 would be crazy, but seven I feel like we can do. All right, so um, as always, we start by saying hello to each other. Um, oh, Karin's here from the Netherlands again. I love seeing that. Hi, Angie. Um, please tell us uh, what you worked on over the weekend. This is one of my favorite parts is to see what you are crafting. If you have pictures, please um, feel free to post them in the comment section. I started a little baby cowichan that I'm designing for, um, I'm not going to tell you what it's going to be, but I'm designing it for UU Yarns for to be ready for TNNA, which is our the industry market, um, if you're in the knitting and crochet world, you go to a market um, to see all the new yarns. And if you're a yarn store owner, you go there to buy the yarns and that kind of thing. So I'm designing that for you. So that's really what I worked on um, a little bit. I mostly just kind of hung out. I had uh, I had the crew over. We had the crew from Production 4 over to our house as a thank you for all of their hard work on our Kickstarter campaign for the Knit Show. And we just started talking about we're in full-on pre-production right now, which is really exciting. Um, we've got 19 out of the 20 guests who will be appearing on the first season of The Knit Show booked already. And man, they're coming from everywhere, from all over the country. Also, we have a woman from Brazil coming, one from Canada, everybody believing in this project. So I'm so excited about that. If you are interested in staying up to date for you know this The Knit Show, which is going to be the first community-funded, internationally accessible knitting and crochet episodic series. We are launching in October, but you can subscribe to YouTube now. So as we get information, you will be the first to have it. So until I get a pretty like glamorous URL, it takes a little time. Right now, if you just go to the Facebook page, The Knit Show, click on Learn More at the top, and it'll take you right there. If you would subscribe, that would be awesome. You might as well like the Facebook page while you're there. And hey, you might be, want to be on a roll, go over to Instagram and also follow um, at The Knit Show. I'm trying to keep that feed really pretty and kind of in the color palette of the logo and to celebrate all of the amazing backers and guests and yarn companies that are going to be a part of it. So it's so great to see all of you um, coming in and talk to each other. Remember that this is your space too. Use the comment section to talk to each other. Enjoy the fact that, um, you know, Chris is in, in Northern California, um, but I just men mentioned that Karin is in the Netherlands. And every week they meet each, almost every week, the two of them come on and they meet each other and hang out you know, unbeknownst to them probably. So that's my favorite part of being able to do these videos with you. All right, so I should probably stop, you know, rambling on because we have got a lot of material to cover. Um, oh, also, if you're if you're coming on and telling me where you're from, if you're from another country that is not the United States or Canada, if you wouldn't mind telling me how you found these videos, I'm fascinated. Le the last, last week, was our video uh, number 69. It was corner to corner crochet. We had viewers from 11 different countries watching that one. I was just blown away, but I have no idea how you're finding me. And so I would, if you would do me a solid, Carol in the UK, how did you find us? If you do me a solid and let us know because we want more of that for the Knit Show, I'd really appreciate that. Just go ahead and post that. All right, so I took questions from both Facebook and Instagram. So I'm gonna just kind of dive in. Um, if I get to a subject that is not your jam, just go get a go get a cup of coffee. Or if you're in the UK where it's you know after five, get yourself a glass of wine, come back, and maybe loop back in when you're uh, when you're back to a subject that you're interested in. Okay, question number one is from Mary Catherine. She wants to know 
Okay, so she wants to talk granny squares. We haven't really talked those in a while, so I thought it would be fun. So I'm going to do one demo, and everything else is going to be a little talky. Um, so she realized, or she's seen a lot of tutorials on granny squares on how to, to alternate colors every round. But she was wondering how you, when you don't have to change the colors, how you just continue and do that jog over. And what I think that she means by that is that when you're working in granny rounds, it's not the same, um, the round doesn't begin and end the same every round. So instead of me trying to explain what she means, I think that I'm going to show you. Uh, Tier 2 from Finland, how did you find us? It's so nice to have you there. Please let me know how you found these videos. Um, so what I thought we would do is, why don't we just have a granny square refresh? And then hopefully during that refresh, it will actually answer Mary Catherine's question. All right, so, uh, no, Catherine, it was not supposed to be you, but if you asked, if you asked the exact same question, then awesome, and that's also weird. Um, it's like a palindrome. No, that's completely untrue. Be I'm going to move on before I just say anything else weird and babbly. Okay, I'm going to flip it around now, and this will be the only part that's kind of demo-y, so let's see what we can do. All right, so I'm gonna just go ahead and work on a granny in general. Whilst at the same time, because I'm a ninja like that, I'm gonna also answer a Instagram question from Celtic Clo 19 who was curious about reading charts. Now, she was kind of open to both knitting and crochet charts, and I'm going to, if there's time, talk about both, but why not do the, this at the same time? So if you have a hard time reading word patterns, sometimes, especially with crochet, the charts like this can be wondrous because every single stitch is, ma is mapped out for you. So I'm going to just reference this really quickly as I'm working around. And I won't do it for the entire chart, but just to give you a little idea how that goes. All right. So I'm going to really go fast through this first round since we're not doing a full on granny square tutorial. If you do want a beginning to end tutorial on granny squares, a progressive one, I have a creative live class called Crochet Maker 102, and I go, I, go, I get really in depth there. Oh, Lori, you're Celtic Clo. I did not know that. Well, hey, the bridge is together. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so we're going to chain six. And then we're going to join the round with a slip stitch. And then from here, we're going to chain three. The chain three is the height of, if you're in North America, it's a double crochet. If you're in the UK, it is a treble. Now, Lori, I'm talking to you. What we've done here is we've chained three and now I'm moving over to the double, I think you're in North America, so it would be a double crochet for you right here in the center loop. So these, this little ovals, these ovals are chains, and there will always be a key that tells you this, so don't feel like you have to memorize these symbols. Um, and then you just kind of follow. And since we're working in the round, what happens is we follow around here, and then here, it's counterclockwise. Okay, so I've chained three, and then I'm gonna do my double crochet. And again, I'm not gonna go very slow showing this because we're. this is just a quick refresher. I've created my first cluster for that first round, which would be three uh, double crochets or trebles, depending on where you are. That chain counting as the first stitch. chaining three, and then we're going to repeat and do three double crochets. The, whoops, I just slid out. The chain three that I just did will be the corners of the granny square, and you'll see that kind of form before your eyes. Okay, so if you can see here, this, it's actually like this, to be honest with you. We've done this part, this part, and this part. 
Does that make sense? We've got someone else from the Netherlands. Jacqueline, could you please tell us how you found us? Oh, you did. You did right there. How about I just read what you said? Found on, on YouTube. Oh, that's great. Please also go onto YouTube and look for The Knit Show. That's where my brand new quote unquote TV series will be this fall. And we're, we're asking people to subscribe now so that everybody can find us. I'm really excited about being able to have a show that is international like this. I can't wait that I, I get to hang out with you guys all the time. Okay, so you're going to continue in this manner, making our corners. And thank you for sharing these videos. Word of mouth helps a lot with these live videos, so I really appreciate it. There are 69 other videos, so if you're interested in little tidbits here or you're looking for something to binge watch, binge watch just go to facebook.com slash Vicki Howell slash videos. Okay, so I'm rounding out my last corner, and this is round one. This is also where I'm going to join my second color. I'm just going to stop because we're doing double duty here. So you can see that we have now worked this entire round and I'm right here. So now what we need to do is we need to join. We want to join, but we're also joining not only the round, but we're joining the color. So to do that, we want to work in the top of the chain three. What I do to find where I'm going to join, because it's not always clear in crochet, to be honest with you. I like to follow, I work backwards sometimes, so I know that this is a post stitch. I run my finger up. Okay, that belongs to this. I can see they're connected. So I go to the next one. Okay, those are connected. So that means this must be the top. That must be where I need to join. Not the most scientific method, but it works in a pinch. Okay, then from here, you're going to insert your hook and then you're going to lay over the new color. Pull it through both loops and now you've joined. Now you can ditch your second color. I don't have scissors, but let's just pretend we've done that. So from here, what our chart says is that, well, I'm actually doing a little bit different than this chart, but we'll just work with me. So what we're going to do now are the chains to move over to this next space. So, Laura, you get the idea. From here, you would just follow all the way around and follow all the way around. Let me move this out of the way. So what it means is, so we're going to work three chains, which will count as the first double crochet or treble, wherever you are, which at the end. It's actually going to be the end one, but you'll see what I mean in a second. And then an additional one, which is going to count as the chain one, which gets us over this space. So then we're going to work our corners. And you can see here from this chart, let me move it up a little bit. The chart is, again, those three uh, double crochets if you are in, the, in North America, treble if you're not, and then chain three and th three, and those make the corners. So I'm going to just show that, and then I'll move on to show, to answer what I think is Mary Catherine's question. Okay, so... One, two, three, and then I'm going to chain three, and then I'm going to make that cluster of three again, The other cool thing about crochet and charts is a lot of it is international. So some of the coolest crochet patterns are in Japanese magazines, and you can kind of figure it out without having to get it translated because they're they're really big on charts over there. Okay, so there's my first corner made. And so then you would continue around as, as the pattern called for. And what you would get is something that looks like this little guy. And this is where I'm going to show a couple rounds or just the ends of a couple rounds for Mary Catherine so we can talk about how we continue our round without joining another color. All right, so we've worked all the way around and we are now at our last corner. So we know for a corner we need that cluster of post stitches, the doubles or the trebles. We need the three chains. Now here is where things are going to get a little different. Remember at the beginning of this round, we made that chain four. One of those chains counts as the chain that kind of gives us a little wiggle room over 
over the round below. But this chain three actually counts as our last double treble crochet, double or treble crochet rather, in the grouping. So we only do two, and then we're going to count one, two, three, join with a slip stitch. And I, just for good measure, like to do another slip stitch. It's just, it's completely unnecessary. I just like to do it. Because from here, we want to start our next round, which will be a chain three and then three post stitches in the chain space. So for granny squares, progressively you just do more and more in between the corners of these chain three little cute little clusters until you get to corners. So that's how you would do the first little jog. Let me show you what it would look like after you'd work that round and then you'd work to the next round because this this round is going to look a little bit different when you join it as well. So same thing that we were talking about, we've done our corners, we've done our little three clusters um, in the areas where we're not working corners. So now I'm at my last corner. And this one, I, I am going to work, because I, of where I began the round, I am gonna work the entire corner. So that's a cluster of three. chain three, and then another cluster of three. Okay, if you're just joining me, um, today we are answering the questions from moms. It's viewer's choice. So we've got, we're jam packed with questions that people have asked about all crafts. Okay, so to join, to change and join this round, we know that we've completed our corner we need to chain an additional chain because we've got to get over this gap. And now it's time to join at the top of the, this chain three. And we have to get started. So from here, we're going to do much like we did below, where we chain four, one, two, three, four. And then we're going to begin our regular cluster. And that four counts will count as a double crochet or treble, depending on where you are, plus one chain one. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, Vicki, she's saying that she the charts are difficult because of dyslexia. Check out Robin Chichula. She is also dyslexic and she's a designer. She's a she started out as a civil engineer and now she's written several books that are that are based on blueprints, charts blueprints, and she comes from the perspective of knowing what it's like to be dyslexic and work in crochet. So her name is Robin Chichula. You can find her at crochetbyfay.com. Okay. I'm going to flip this camera around now and talk about some more questions. All right, two down. Now we're going to move on. Let me just readjust this camera just a little bit. Now we're going to move on a bit to a different subject. This one is for Michaela McIntyre. So Michaela wants to design, she wants to start designing, and she wants to know what type of projects are the best to sort of like, you know, dip your designer toe into. So I, I really, I, I think that anything that you can plug and play a pattern stitch into is great. So especially, I think it just makes sense to start with scarves or something that's rectangle. So all you need to do is get yourself a great stitch pattern book. Um, there's a million great ones out there. Invest in the books, they're great to have. I know that we have everything at our at our fingertips, but um, it's still, they're really good to have as resources. So then that'll give you a really great foundation for figuring out design because you will start to learn about the math. There's a lot of math involved, how I got into a career with math that has that's so mathy I will never know because but it'll it's it'll be a really great basis for you to figure out because at the very base of all design is figuring out gauge and so if you have a stitch pattern book that has a, a certain multiples that you have to work within and you know how wide you want that piece to be you can right there start off 
and let the design feature be that you're choosing the yarn and the width and the length and what type of fringe and delve in that way. And once you have feel really secure about that, maybe move into a cowl that's done in the round, again with the math. And once you feel secure with that, do something with shaping, maybe like a hat, and then you need to figure out the math for the decreases and just progressively work on that. There's also, um, I, I highly recommend looking at other people's patterns and using them as templates. That's how I learned. Now, fortunately, there are classes out there. If I don't know if, Michaela, if you're a knitter or a crochet or both, but if you're a knitter, there's a class on Craftsy taught by my friend Edie Ekman, and it's called how to say it. It's pattern writing for knitters. So that might be something that would be really worthwhile for you to check out. So uh, all you um, aspiring designers out there, give it a try. Start with a scarf and a great stitch pattern book. All right, thanks again to people who are sharing. Thank you, Skippy Carver, for sharing the video. I, um, I really appreciate you sharing these. It helps me out a lot. Okay, our next question is from Amanda Edwards. This is another kind of kind of crafty business question. She is, um, she has a craft blog and wants to know how to get it noticed. Um, oh, Catherine, she's saying how to say it by, oh, um, let me just step back. The how to say it classes by Edie Ekman. I think she spells her name E-D-I-E and then Ekman on Craftsy. So check that out. Okay, so back to what I was talking about. So Amanda Edwards has a craft blog and her question is, how do I get people to find my craft blog? I'm not going to kid you. It is so much harder now than it used to be uh, when there weren't 5,000 blogs, but also when there wasn't social media because, honestly, people don't read blogs as much as they used to because you can find all that you need here on Facebook or people like to see or Instagram or Pinterest or whatever. So what you really, what it's crucial for you to do is use all of those uh, platforms to get people to come to you. So first of all, what I would do is I would ask you, if I were giving you a mentorship consultation, I would say, where is your strongest audience? So let's say, Renee, don't worry that you missed some of it. You can always watch the recorded version later. Um, so let's say that you that you have, um, you're on Facebook, but you, you, know, you only have a few followers, but on Instagram, you're solid. Like you've got a solid, so you've got a solid thousand, whatever. I would focus there and I would do teasers anytime that you can. Um, it really works to also either on Facebook or on um, Instagram or Pinterest if you do, you know, teaser photos, but also, also if you can do little bit, you can do the beginning of your post on any of those areas where you start, like let's say it's a how-to, you give the first level of instructions and then it's harder to do an Instagram, you have to do it in your profile. But then if you put a link to the rest, then you can get people hooked and they'll follow you. Also, newsletters are crucial because people can't ignore social stuff, but newsletters, you know, they signed up, they wanna know. So that's your captive audience. So you start, again, do the beginning of the post within that newsletter and then let people click through. Um, another thing that you can do is uh, there are sites like craftgossip.com and um, social media, or I'm sorry, craftgossip and craftgawker.com. You can go to both of those and you can submit your stuff and it's just another great way for people to find you. Um, craft Gossip, they have different categories based on where your craft is and you submit your post and if they're into it, then they'll write about it. That gives you a little bit of press. Uh, craft Gawker is a little more visual. It's just they choose pictures, they accept pictures. So if you, I would go on to their site and kind of look at what the aesthetic that they're choosing is, but submit it there. And that's, that'll, that's just a little tidbit on, on other ways. Another thing that's really big right now is something my friend Jennifer Perkins told me about, and they're called linky parties. So there are link parties that happen all across the blogosphere, regardless of what the hobby uh, top or what the topic is. And essentially, groups like hives of people switch off and post like all of these links that are about a certain topic. And so it, it becomes sort of like this big sort of like wiki of whatever it is that you want to know about. Well, there's also certain bloggers who have taken it upon themselves to monetize that and they do, they submit to these linky parties. So I'm going to put a link for you, Amanda, and anyone else who's interested into one, it's called Pink Heels pinktruck.com and she has a whole form that you can fill out and she submits to 100 of these link parties 
like per week. And so you can pay, and it's not a lot of money. It's like 12 bucks or 14 bucks or whatever for, you know, a certain amount of listings. But you're going to get out further. You're going to get out through the mommy bloggers and maybe other audiences that you wouldn't necessarily think of. So those are just a handful of ways that, um, that you can try and get your blog noticed. All right, moving on. Let's go to Melanie Pledger's question. Melanie is ready to try some color work in knitting, and she would like to know what the best type of color work project is to get started on. So stripes are color. So if you're really, really at the, if you really just want to tiptoe into it, I would say just like a great stripe project is awesome. But if you're wanting to sort of step it up a little bit more, I really think that mosaic knitting is a great introduction to color knitting. So I have a couple projects. They're both black and white. And totally done, done at different times. You can tell I kind of like the black and white thing. Um, this is a hat, and this project is free on my website, and I will put this the link to it in my show notes page. I'll make myself a note. This is color work, but you're never working with more than one color at a time. Mosaic stitches are worked with a series of knit stitches and slip stitches, and you can see that the slip stitches give it that little spiked look. So you get both colors in a row, or a round as it were, without having to deal with stranding yet. So it's a really good way to just kind of dip that toe into it. So this is, um, this is a plaid hat that I have, and then I also did a plaid scarf. This plaid scarf was from Fall Knit Simple last year, I believe. You can get that through the Vogue Knitting um, Patterns website. And it's really fun. I did a like a punk rock red and black one, and I did a, a white and gray one. My son modeled this with me, so he wore this one. Um, and so if that's a really good, that's a really good way to just get started on color and then work your way up. Um, and I have tons of easy patterns for also to when you're ready to start stranding. So that hat's gone. Uh, so let's get so that's sort of a great place to start. I also have another pattern. I wasn't even planning on showing you this, but since I have the book here, in one of my books um, called Step It Up Knits, available on Amazon, um, I have another mosaic pattern, and it's a little bit, like it steps it up just a little bit more because it is a set of wrist warmers that I may or may not be able to find live on camera. Um, and so it also has a thumb gusset, so it kind of shakes it up just a little bit more. I may not be able to find it. Um, and then I also have, I think I grabbed it out. Maybe I didn't. Um, oh, here there. So here's, that's all done in mosaic stitch. Same thing, just slip stitches. And again, that is in Step It Up Knits. And then in my most recent book, We Garter Stitch. And I meant to pull this out. I don't know why I didn't do that. I have a mosaic stitch little baby cardi. So really fun, great way to get into color work without having to make the full stranding commitment. So hopefully that was helpful to you, Melanie. All right, getting through the list, what's next? Okay, Maxine, this one's for you. Are you on with me? So Maxine wants to talk about needle gauges. You all have one of these, right? Maybe not necessarily this one. This is my knitting is big in Texas because that's where I live and everything's bigger in Texas. Um, but you probably have something like this laying around. And this is where, you know, where you can check the size of your needles, especially because after, after wear, a lot of times that little number that's written on them can get uh, rubbed off. So her question is, does just the tip need to fit through the hole or should the entire needle slide through the hole so you can figure out what it is? Because it's not always accurate. The answer is that the entire needle should fit through. It should be able to slide and move. If you hit, if the beginning goes in and you can't do that, you know this is not the right size. So you wanna make sure that it slides through. Now also don't get sort of caught up in the fact that sometimes needles are off just a little bit. And it can definitely, it can vary from, you know, different type, different material type too. But if you go in and there's a huge gaping hole, you know that's not right. So you just kind of, you kind of just have to get as close as you want. So this says it's a 10 and a half. Yep, that works. I know that that works. Okay, uh, hold on, I see a question. 
Oh, Rose, you're asking about color pooling? Girl, I got to prep for that one. Yes, we can talk color pooling another time. I think Marley Bird has done a lot of those. You can check out her site. Um, and if that's something that you'd like to do an episode, if any of you are interested in color pooling, um, especially with crochet, it's really big right now, um, let me know. I can do an episode of that. If you're interested in color pooling in an artful way, please check out Laura Bryant's stuff. She kind of, she invented something called the magic number, I think, that um, enables you to be able to do all kinds of pulling that is um, essentially like you're painting with yarn. Okay, so that one is that. All right, now I'm gonna move over to an Instagram question. This is from My Heart's Full, and this is actually a sewing question, shaking things up a little bit. I think that I need to, to flip the camera again. So I'm gonna talk and flip at the same time. So, her question is actually for her mom. Her mom has started sewing again and is working with patterns, but is a little bit confused about the lines and for the different sizes. And she just wanted to know how to sort of explain it to her. So, for those of you that don't sew, this is what a sewing pattern looks like. And now, to be efficient, well not now, it's been like this for years, they come printed like this so that they have several different sizes. Now, you cannot work from this as is because there's no way for you to cut your fabric out and also, you know, have the exact size that you need without cutting the pattern unless you use some transfer paper and a little tool like this and you go around the entire perimeter of the pattern. So usually what we do is we cut them out. But then that kind of renders them useless for all the other sides. So if you decide that you don't want to have that problem, then you need to either take some chalk or you need to get some transfer paper and follow a line. But I think what the question was is how do you know what size that you're working on? So this is very much like my unscientific tip for finding where to join the round and crochet. I'm using my finger again. So let's just look at size four. This is size four. So I'm just gonna take my finger and follow it. Now look at how confusing this gets, right? Like they're they're all butted up against, but if you just take your finger and follow, you can see that this is the slope for size four. And that's really all there is to it. If you're cutting out these patterns, make sure that you cut the notches. You just add a little bit so that you will know where to match up your pieces later. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, and I'm back. Y'all are making me hustle today. All right, um, and I actually think that was all seven of them. Let me do a quick scroll to see if there was anything else. You got very quiet for a second. Did I shut you down with all of this like blabbering on? Okay, I'm going through. Um, Linda wants to know if, I've ever, if I ever use a loose set. I have used a loose set, as a matter of fact. Um, and I, I actually, um, I recommend checking out my friend um, Jennifer Henson from Stitch Diva. She has a, is it an ebook or a book out on all loose set projects? And she does a lot of projects working with them. And she's been a guest on, maybe on, oh, she's been a guest on Nitty Gritty for sure. She was also a virtual guest on, um, on Knitting Daily, so we've talked a lot about Lucette's for sure. Uh, Katie said, cool green needles, thank you. I love these, these are my daisy needles. These are from a company called Crystal Palace. Um, I haven't seen them in years, I'm pretty sure they still exist, but they're really lightweight and super fun. Um, all right, I'm gonna do a big scroll through just to make sure I haven't, man, these, these videos used to be like 15, 20 minutes, and now they're getting longer and longer, so I apologize for taking up so much time of your day. Okay, it looks like that's it. Okay, so if you are watching later, if you're not watching this live and you still have questions, please just post them. I will be checking back in to try and answer them in the comments section. Um, please, if you know anybody that's interested in knitting, crochet, crafting, a small business, please share the entire playlist. Again, it's Ask Me Monday. I'm here almost every Monday, 12 p.m. Central, 6 p.m. UK time. That wasn't at all. <laughs> um, I think it's GMT. Uh, let's see, 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific, um, and share it with a friend. And if you're watching from another country, please let me know how you found us. Next week, I will be covering 
intro to garter stitch intarsia. So that should be super fun. That's brought to you by Clover. So look for that. And we will be talking about how to create a cute little coyote, which is the gateway, the knitting gateway drug to a project in my Wee Garter Stitch book that I hope you all try out because it's one of my favorites. And it is called the um, Coyote Kid Sweater. So once you learn how to do the stitch pattern, you'll be able to figure that one out. And then, well, I'll be happy. All right, thank you so much once again for starting your week with me. Um, if you're looking for any audio inspiration, please check out Craftish. You can find it on iTunes, which I think they've actually renamed to Apple Podcasts now not sure, or Stitcher or SoundCloud or through vickihowell.com, wherever you get your podcasts. We're on hiatus now, but there are a ton, there are, I think, 40 to listen to, um, all different walks of crafty life to inspire you. Um, check out my creative live classes. I have nine on knitting and crocheting, including garment making, sock making, um, crochet sweater making. And then I also have a monetize your craft business class. So you can find that at creativelive.com. And I think that is it. Don't forget to check out The Knit Show on YouTube. We're not there yet, but subscribe there for when we are on Instagram. It's just at The Knit Show and here on Facebook. And I will see you next week. Mwah. Have a great week. Don't forget to take some time to be creative. Bye.